So good morning, everyone. I'm Armando Romani, a postdoc at the Blue Brain Project. I will present you the current state of the rat hippocampus CA1 in the Human Brain Project. So this is an outline of my presentation. I will introduce you the hippocampus, our few slides on our modeling approach. Then I will talk about the circuit building validation and simulation. And then I will close, you, um, I will close with some final remarks. So let's introduce the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a brain region that is below the temporal lobe of the human brain. It's very similar across the different uh, mammalian species. So from now on, we will talk about the rat hippocampus. will be the focus on uh, my presentation, but some of the things will be shared uh, with the other mammalian species. So in the rat, you see the hippocampus as a very prominent structure below the cortex. If you remove it and use slices, you can identify several sub-regions within the hippocampus. This is a schematic representation of uh, the internal structure. And you see there are the CA3, CA, CA2, CA1. Uh, together, they are called a uh, hippocampus proper. Then there is this dentate gyrus, uh, together with the first three normally uh, we call hippocampus. And sometimes people uh, talk about the hippocampus formation, including also cortical region like the antonial cortex, parasubiculum, presubiculum, and subiculum. You can see here also the relation between uh, the different subfields. They are interconnected via the excitatory principal cells that send uh, uh, long axon uh, that projects from one region to the other. So we will focus on the C1. Let's go closer. And we can see that the C1 is composed by uh, four layers. In each layer, there are several cell types. For simplicity, we say that it contains the C1 only one excitatory cells. It is pyramidal cells with the soma in stratum pyramidale. And it's already, uh, if you count all the pyramidal cells, already we take into account 80, 90 percentage of the cells. And they have uh, um, the soma. It's really densely packed in this small layer called stratum pyramidale. The other cells are interneurons, let's say roughly 20 cell types. They are distributed along the other layers. And they basically, with their activity, they shape uh, the, the output of the pyramidal cells. What the hippocampus does? Uh, it does many things. One of the most prominent features is that the hippocampus plays a key role in memory. There are several kinds of memory. In particular, the hippocampus plays a role in, uh, in, in the episodic memory. It means our memory of episodes, events that happen in space and time. In fact, the hippocampus also plays a role in keeping um, the time, our perception of time, and our perception of space. Here you see uh, how different cell types behave when an animal is put in a, an environment. This is a typical experiment. So, you, you leave uh, the rat freely moving in an environment, you keep track of its path, and then you put an electrode in one cell in the hippocampus, and then you record the activity. And here you see the spike. So what happens uh, when, when the animal is, is in a particular space, you have a high probability of firing. So the cells fire more with a higher probability. It means the cells encode only a subspace of, of this environment. So, and this first example is called play cells. You have other cells that encode uh, the direction of the dead. It means uh, where the animal is going to move. You have other cells that have a more complicated uh, patterns in relation to the space, other cells that encode the borders, and so on. So every year, we are discovering new and new cells. So. A couple of slides on the, our modeling approach. When you tackle a brain region, even if 
the brain region like the hippocampus where we have a lot of data and when every year we accumulate new and new data is still a challenging um, uh, modeling approach because we don't have enough data and probably will never cover all the data we need. It's like a puzzle in which we have only two or three pieces. We have to guess what are the missing pieces. There are several ways how we can uh, tackle this problem. It's, it's doable, it's not uh, impossible. And one of the uh, tools we have is the validation. So we make assumption, we make educated guess, and then what we do, we validate our model. We say, okay, we guess, and then let's see if the model, the final model, behave as we expect. This is a schematic representation of the model life cycle. So we built a model, we simulate it, then we have a working circuit here, and then we run validation, and then see how good are our um, assumption, our guesses. And then we plan, so maybe we fail. It doesn't matter. We plan what is the next refinement of the model. And we go on, we go on. When we have a release, when we have a, um, a version of the circuit that will satisfy us, then we can release it. The point of this modeling approach is that we want to make this cycle quite quick. We don't want to get stuck uh, in details. They say, let's build the perfect model and then validate it. We want to guess and then build it and validate it and so on. The idea came from uh, this um, software development approach called Scrum or Agile. And here it's a very schematic uh, idea. So if you have to build a car, Sometimes a good approach is not to build a perfect wheel, a perfect, a perfect gear, a perfect engine, and then only at the end you have a working object, the perfect car. Sometimes it's better to build something that really loosely resembles a car. Let's say, make you move. A skateboard, a bike, a motorbike, but then you have, in each step, you have a working item. And there are several reasons why we do this. One of the, I mentioned one, because we learn also by doing, by guessing what the, for example, the hippocampus sh should look like. We learn what are the major uh, problems, what are, sometimes uh, we don't want to constrain everything. Sometimes we have a lot of parameters came from free. So we don't have to constrain everything. So we will, we will mention some of the examples. So we learn what are the most fundamental properties where to plug in and other that are not really necessary. Okay, so let's talk about circuit building and validation. So why I put together now, I, maybe you are having an idea now because there are really two steps close each other. So this is the, um, the workflow for building the model. It came from the seminal work by uh, Eri Markram and colleague and published in 2015. They applied this workflow to the somatosensory cortex microcircuit. If you haven't read the paper, I suggest you to read it. It's a very big paper. It's 100 pa pages if you include also methods. But it's really, um, it's really interesting. I mean, it contains a lot of idea. I really recommend this. So, and we apply the same thing to the hippocampus, of course, with some, some changes because the hippocampus is not an hexagonal prism. It's curved. I mean, the geometry is more complex. We have different cell types, different properties, and so on. But the basic principles are already described in this paper. So, Giannani will talk uh, more in details about this, but it's important I mention the, the major steps. So we start by identifying the, the principal cell types of, of the region. We collect a reconstruction of those cell types. We define the region of interest. 
we populate this volume respecting uh, what we know about the cell density and cell compositions. Then we derive the connectome by find all the possible uh, synapses between, uh, by looking at the proximity between axon and dendrites. And what we obtain, we obtain far more synapses than expected. So we have to prune them. We have to discard uh, uh, a good part of it. But mm, as Jandani will show, we don't do that randomly. We follow a special algorithm in order to match what we know about uh, properties of a real connector, button density, synapses per connection, and so on. Then we assign to each cell an electrical model. And this was the talk by Michele and colleagues. And then we have to assign the synapse pro uh, properties. And then at the end, we have a working circuit. So as I mentioned, so we start from morphologies. Here you see this is the principal cell, the only excitatory cell type. And here are all the other interneurons. In this table, you see several cells. Those are all the different cell types. And some, sometimes the cell types can appear in one or two layers. So we, we call them different cell types. And you see all the color cells are the cell type that's which were described in this review, Bezer and Soltesch 2013. Uh, there are other cell types described, but they are more rare, and then we don't know much about them. So let's, let's focus on those. And you, will, you see that um, we only cover the cells which are highlight in green. So it's less than half. Nevertheless, we want to build the model because this is the best we can do at the moment. So those are the data we have, and then we build this model. Once we have new data, we can integrate it and make the model better. Again, this is our best guess. Once we populated the volume, then we can start the validation. Here you see some of this validation anyway, you will see in practice during the ends on session. So here you see a very basic validation is the cell density. So for example, here we measure the pyramidal cell density in stratum pyramidale. Here we measure the overall density in C1 and so on. So I want to say a couple of words here. So first of all, for example, this, the density of pyramidal cells in stratum pyramidale is actually a parameter of the model. So why I say validation? So maybe validation is not the right word. It's, you can call it quality check, unit testing, and so on. But the point is, uh, so we want to for sure be sure that the circuit building process is correct. Maybe there is a bug. And, but also sometimes when you um, follow in this building approach, sometimes you, you say, I want this cell density, but there are many other parameters that constrain the density of the cells. For example, we have the volume. We have also, uh, we try also not to overlap the soma, uh, the, the, um, the soma of the cells. So there are other constraints. So it's not necessarily true that if you want to, if you plug in this parameter, you obtain this parameter as an output. So it's important to test it. So I mix sometimes validation, there are more proper validation, with validation there are more quality check. Nevertheless, it's important because we want to, at the end, have a measure, have a global measure of the goodness of the model. Uh, regardless if I'm using this parameter to constrain the model or if a new data set, anyway, my set of validation describe how good is the model. And through the refinements, I see progresses of the model. At the same time, I don't want to, for example, improve one validation and ruin all the other ones. So I need to make the model better and better through time. Some validation I already expect they fail. For example, this is the overall uh, cell density in C1. And of course, as I showed you before, uh, I'm placing less 
cell types in the CA1. So I expect there will be less neurons, so a lower um, cell density in CA1. Here you see the cell composition. So what is the percentage of the different cells? And uh, this is, for example, again, is the percentage of pyramidal cells compared to experimental data in, in uh, orange. Again, since I'm placing less interneurons, I expect uh, less, um, it fails in this, in this validation. But it doesn't matter at this point. So we build, uh, then we build the connectome, we validate the connectome. This is the number of synapses per connection. What does it mean? So when you have uh, a connection between a cell A and cell B, they uh, can contact each other with one or more synapses. And this is the button density, so how many synapses you have uh, per length of accents. And here you see the, the model is on the x-axis and the experiment on the y-axis. So ideally, all the points should uh, lie on, on, the, uh, on the diagonal. So you see it's a, it's a good agreement. This is a good example. So those are the parameters of the model, Ma I don't, but I don't uh, match perfectly the experimental data because that depends by many, many other parameters. Anyway, it's a good agreement for me at this level. Of course, this, we, can, we can perform many other validation. This is more uh, an higher level validation, is the divergence per M type. So this, you can see the different cell types. For each cell type, you can say how many other uh, cells it contacts. For example, the, these AA, axonic cells, contact all pyramidal cells, 100% of the pyramidal cells. In other cases, they contact 98 pyramidal cells and 2% of interneurons. This is the model. This is the experimental data. If you see missing uh, bars, it means when I analyze a subset of the circuit, I couldn't find these rare cell types. And here you see already, I can say qualitatively, they look similar apart one case, the pyramidal cells. So in the experiment, uh, it seems the pyramidal cells have uh, an equal probability to contact a pyramidal cell, so an interneuron. And, and then I can perform other, and then I say, okay, this is a little bit suspicious. Let's go, let's go deeper. And then I check, for example, the connection probability. And what I see here, the connection probability between PCPC, it's higher in the model than experimental data. So it means if, uh, if the pyramidal cells uh, diverge more on the other pyramidal cells here, it means he has an higher probability to contact PC here, right? So it basically reflects what I see. And then I have other supporting validation that say the network is too active. And again, so this is was the object of the current refinement of the network. So then we have to constrain, uh, um, so for each cell types, uh, there are several finding patterns that the cell types can describe. For example, this perforant pathway associated only describe uh, the bursting accommodating finding pattern, but there are other cell types that describe uh, two. So, and then we derive what is called the morpho-electrical composition. So what is the ratio of the different uh, finding patterns in each cell type? And then we build uh, an electrical model for each cell type. So I don't want to go into details because you already learned this. Then we have to constrain synapses. And after we constrain, based on the literature, based on uh, fitting uh, um, the traces, real traces, then we can again perform a validation. This is uh, uh, post-synaptic potential measured in the soma. So we basically replicate the experiment. We take uh, two neurons. This is a uh, parvalbumin, uh, parvalbumin positive basket cells, uh, pyramidal cells. So we make the first cells 
uh, active, and then we record uh, uh, the PSP in the sum of the postsynaptic cells. And then we, here we compare the in vitro, so the, the experiment, with the model. Again, you see some pathways performing better, some pathways performing worse. But we keep track and move on. Then also the model contains a short-term plasticity, short-term dynamics of, of, of the, the cells. Again, here you see uh, the same pathways, parvalbumin positive basket cells towards pyramidal cells. And here you see uh, that the fitting it's, it's relatively good. Uh, in in uh, red, you have the fitted traces, and in the green one, you have an average of the experiment. So, as you will see, uh, most of the simulation we are performing now uh, are based on spontaneous synaptic activity. This is, again, a, another parameter we have to constrain. Here you see a pyramidal cells covered with different synapses. Pay attention, all these synapses are internal to the CA1. So they, they don't come from outside. Uh, this is actually only a minority of the synapses because, as you saw, there is not uh, uh, too much interconnection between pyramidal cells and pyramidal cells. So the, the experimental data says that we have one percentage of probability PC-PC connections. So it means the rectory should be driven, should be driven by another uh, projecting axon. And most of the innervation came from the CA3. And the CA3 made much more synapses on pyramidal cells. So let's say one pyramidal cell has roughly 30,000 synapses on it, and 28, 29 came from outside mainly in CA3, but also entering our cortex. So those are only 1,000 synapses came from the uh, internal connectivity. So what they did here, so I, I take several papers to constrain the synaptic, the spontaneous synaptic event. What does it mean? Even if they don't, uh, uh, the synapses, even if they're not activated by a presynaptic action potential, they can uh, spontaneously release a vesicle. They do that very, uh, with a very low rate, but we have a lot of those synapses. So even if uh, uh, they came with a very, I don't know, I mean, it's one over uh, 10,000 hertz, but there are 30,000 synapses, then the final result is to have uh, um, so a neuron C spontaneous event with a rate of, let's say, 3 hertz. So this is, in particular, one experiment of uh, recording all the excitatory spontaneous synaptic events in a pyramidal cells, in an excitatory cells. Look only at the TTX. Uh, this other trace is a, is a control, is another experiment. So the TTX is the basic one. We are interested in this. This is the trace. This is uh, what is the average amplitude of the spontaneous event. This is the rate around 3 hertz. I constrain. Uh, again, it's a sort of guess because depends on how many synapses I have in the model, and this depends on the position of the cells. There is a huge variability, but also depends on the failure rate of this. So I, again, I need to constrain, but I need again to validate it. This is the validation. So on overall, my guess was quite good. This is, again, the amplitude, and this is, again, the frequency. The amplitude, I would say, it's more a real validation because this is an amplitude of uh, the set of many, many other, it's an average of many, many other synapses which they have their own parameters. So I didn't constrain directly. So then the model is complete. We can simulate it. And it was, I mean, after years, we constrained the model. I say, okay, let's switch on the model. And I really didn't know what to expect. I don't know. I say, let's switch it and see what happens. This is what happens. Those are only pyramidal cells, the excitatory cells. 
Uh, here you see a Russell plot with uh, 100 different uh, pyramidal cells pick, uh, picked randomly. And you see they, they start firing. Then you probably have uh, uh, inhibition. They activate inhibitory cells. They lower the activity of the pyramidal cells. And then again, they fire and so on. Here you see, here I've been at the different events, so it's, it's more evident what happens to the network. Uh, those are five different um, cells picked up randomly. Here you see also, we, in the model, so we have uh, variability of the cells. So, so they're not perfectly equal. There are some cells that fire much more, the cells that only fire at the initial few seconds and then they stop and so on. So we say, let's, let's perform this local field potential. It's a something prominent in the hippocampus. We know uh, in labs, they always do this because they show nice properties. So we place several electrodes across the depths of the CA1. We compute this local field potential that is a measure of the population uh, uh, voltage. And here we, you see the traces. So first, notic first thing we notice is a phase shift. So if you look at the peaks, they, here you have a peak, but here you have a valley. So it basically the, the, the phase shift across the different layer, this is something that was experimentally measured. And then also we see some kind of oscillatory behavior. So we made a power spectrum of one trace, in particular the trace at the level of the pyramidal cells, and we see there is a nice peak in the theta range between 4 and 10 hertz. So we can do also the spectrogram, and there is one evident band in the theta range. Uh, so this is not something that, the, yeah. So LFP, so we use a tool that basically uh, sum all the currents through all the compartments, uh, but it's a weighted sum. So it's uh, divided by the distance between the point of where you measure and the, the, the source of current. All the, all the currents that pass through a compartment, all. It's a very expensive computation. So uh, this is very interesting because we don't constrain the model to reproduce uh, theta oscillations. It's, a, it's an emergent properties. So the model is actually not made for a specific purpose. We just uh, look at the data and we build a model that resembles the data, the fit, if you want, the data. So it can be used with several uh, different studies for, to test several hypotheses. It was interesting because then we found this paper that says if they, the authors just remove the hippocampus from the brain, they cut off the CA3, so they leave the CA1 alone, and they show, in, uh, uh, they show more or less the same problem, uh, the same uh, uh, features. So oscillation in theta, here you see the spectrogram, here you see the different phases, then also there are shift, and so on. So it, it was really interesting. Then we see, they say, okay, let's see visually uh, how the, the simulation look like. So the initial phase, you have a very high activation, but this is due to the, the initial transition phase. And then you see activities of the cells. But it's interesting because those activities seem to are traveling. They are moving from one side to the other. It's a little bit chaotic in this, in this uh, simulation, but seems there is some kind of pattern. Again, it resembles something that we know. That is, so this is a little bit slow, the traveling theta waves in the hippocampus. This is the first paper that described this, and then there are other papers that support this discovery. And you can read 
In freely behaving rats, so tidal oscillation in area C1 are traveling waves that propagate roughly along the septotemporal axis of the hippocampus. And again, it was really surprising. We even didn't think about this when we built the model. But here it is. So, few final remarks. As I mentioned to you, through the validation, we know there is uh, maybe an important problem to correct is the divergence of the pyramidal cells. The PCPC probability is too high compared to the experimental data, so we have to lower this because the overall activity is too high. Of course, if we change the model, we have to run again all the simulation because it's not guaranteed that it's going to confirm all, all the results on theta oscillation. But I have to say, by our uh, experience, uh, those theta oscillation are quite robust. So we hope that it will, we will confirm this. Once we, we reproduce the theta oscillation and the theta waves, we want to really use the model to make predictions. We want to analyze what are the cellular synaptic mechanisms of the theta oscillation. How much we trust our prediction depends how good is the model. So we somehow we trust more the model if the model resembles more the experimental data. It's more validated. The more we validate the model, more we trust it. And then we want to, of course, publish and release the model to via the brain simulation platform so you also can play with it and test your own hypothesis. The project, of course, it's uh, a cooperation by many researchers. A lot of people came from the Blue Brain project, but we have also experts in, 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 in other institutes. The UCL is providing most of the data, the reconstructions, the electrophysiological data, uh, the Koch Institute in, in, in Budapest, in Hungary. They are also experts in single cell validation. And the, CN, the CNR with Michele Migliore and his team is involved in single cell modeling. Also, they are performing now a lot of analysis on the network simulation. But the hippocampus is even more than this, because what we are trying to do is to build a community behind this. See, even a larger community is not, so uh, HPP, it's open to, for, co for external collaborators. So we don't want to maintain these, even, even now, during the development of the model, we are still open for new collaborators. They want to join the project, because it's really challenging to model a brain region like this because we are modeling several scales in terms of space because we go from subcellular to the network but also in terms of time because now the model is only taking into account a few hundred milliseconds it is valid only for a few hundred milliseconds because we have this short-term plasticity but we want to also include long-term plasticity it's a very challenging we need a lot of experts, we need a lot of institutes that find a consensus on how uh, the hippocampus model should, should be. So we created a couple of workshops in 2015, in 2017 to discuss what are the uh, possible cooperation across several institutes, across several countries. And we, we are planning to have more other of these workshops. With this, I conclude, and I thank you for your attention.